All right, I'm going to call Becky up. Okay. Everybody, welcome Becky Glazuski. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I love November. November is filled with celebrations for my family. We have like literally six birthdays. And though it's going to feel a little bit different this November, I am going to see my daughter on Sunday who turns 21. My baby turns 21. I don't know how that happened. But anyway, it's also the month of Thanksgiving, which I absolutely love. But what's really cool is that for the ministry, it is the month of thanks with giving. So I don't know how many of you ladies are new to studies this year, but for the last three years, we have had a thanks with giving generosity uh, campaign challenge uh, for the ministry. And this is the coolest thing because we get to invite you to join God in what he's doing in and through MFM. And um, for those of you that don't know, the campaign first began in 2017 because a few ladies that attended one of our studies felt called to not only support the ministry financially, but to also encourage all of us, the other gals that are in Bible study, to do the same. And to do that, they graciously stepped forward with very large gifts donations, um, as matching funds to then incent us to give, thereby basically providing doubling, doubling the funds, you know, the matching gifts. So in 2017, we prayed what we thought was just big, huge, audacious prayers, and really, honestly, I have to say that you know, I really didn't know if we were going to make it. And I love that God so grew up my faith that way. But we wanted to raise $30,000 in 30 days. In 2018, we worked to raise $40,000 in 40 days. And in 2019, it was $60,000 in 60 days. And every year, a 50% match was brought forward right to to begin with. So we were 50% of the way to the goal. And each year, not only did we meet the goal, but we exceeded the goal. Can I get a hallelujah? That's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, Amen. exactly. Woo! So, so I was a bit surprised and very, uh, just, just overwhelmed really that this year, despite these unprecedented times, and once again, these faithful women came forward and they wish to remain anonymous, by the way. They always tell me they want their blessings in heaven. But they have brought forth their gifts uh, to match or double what we can uh, collect. And they um, have already given us $25,000. Mm. So isn't that amazing? I mean, it's just, it's humbling. So beginning uh, Monday night, November 2nd, and running through December 12th, we're going to um, pray to raise support of $50,000 in 30 days for Margo Fieser Ministries. And what we do is we ask the women who regularly attend our Bible studies to participate in this. And also those who are watching online this year. Hi, ladies at home. Um, to respond personally and with contagious generosity. So our goal is 50 in 40 days, and we can continue to share the good news of Jesus and teach women to know Jesus personally, passionately, powerfully, and preeminently. So when I'm done speaking and while Margo is speaking, the ushers are going to be providing you a letter with some more details as well as a pledge card for you to take home. Please don't feel like you have to get it out and read it now. We really want you to take it home and we want you to pray over it. Pray over it before responding. So in the coming weeks, I'm going to be sharing a lot of information with you regard to our budget and our expenses, what your donations accomplish, and how God continues to stretch each dollar to further his reach to this world, and how he also stretches the funds that he provides for us to make it go even farther. And I want to encourage you to contact me. My information is in the letter, and I would love to talk to any and all of you. Um, my phone is on there. You can text or call me or email me. Um, and I just want to make sure that you know um, that you can get answers, and we want to be very transparent with you about the ministry. And so um, I'll ask Margot to work her way forward here. And I just want to thank you so much 
for prayerfully considering how you'd like to participate in what we feel is just an amazing and exciting opportunity. Uh, if it were not uh, for your generosity, we would not be able to exist. Uh, your sacrificial giving of your time and your talent and your treasures truly have an eternal impact uh, because our lives are changed by Jesus and we have been changed to bring change. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Margo, and I would invite um, Linda and Michelle to go ahead and hand out those cards. Thanks. Thank you, dear. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Becky is our incredible CFO. Uh, that's what she did in her other life, which is a good, good thing. So thank you, Lord, uh, for that. I just want to share with you, this kind of time of year is really exciting because um, you just continue to trust the unseen. And um, this was never thought of by us. This totally came from the Lord. It became a nonprofit in 2014. And God just um, wonderfully worked. And people kept coming forward and saying, you know, well, why don't we do like a fundraiser and we'll give, you know, matching and this, this. And then they just kept coming. And we're like, okay, Lord, just, you know, just show us, just show us. I want you to know as well, um, I take no monies at all uh, from, I don't have a salary, don't have anything from MFM. It just all goes back into uh, the ministry and events and, and, uh, and how God works. So it's just an incredible time of seeing him do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine. So I, I want to be the person who shares about changed lives because we don't have like, um, we don't make widgets. We don't have a product, right? It's a service industry, right? MFM is a service industry, but God makes the product, Right? God makes the product because God makes changed lives. He's changed my life and he changes your life, right? He makes us into disciples so we can disciple to disciple to disciple to disciple, right? And that's who we are in him. He is the door opener with a capital D, capital O, and he's opening whole new doors uh, for us in and through MFM, even through this unprecedented time. To think that God had already closed, I'm on the board at the Y, and God had closed the door at the Y because of this, and it also closed the door at Zion because uh, we could not social distance, and already had opened up Whitestone for us, which is amazing. He already had opened that up for us, and so we're walking through the doors that he has opened, okay? Not sure what it looks like on the other side, right? But that's because you walk by faith and not by sight. That's why you trust the unseen, right? You don't trust the seen. So, you guys, this is a desperate world. Would you agree with me? Yeah. This is a desperate world. It's a desperate world. And it needs desperate measures. And God has great big plans. He's calling people to himself. And we can join him. We're a part of that, okay? We're joining him. And we're asking you to join us in what he is doing in and through the ministry. Because we have the hope that the world needs. I have the hope that the world needs. You have the hope that the world needs. You have the hope that the world needs. We have it. We have the good news of Jesus Christ. And you affect your sphere of influence, wherever it is, it could be coworkers, it could be your family, it could be um, your husband, it could be your neighbors, it could be uh, just friends that you meet or acquaintances. You affect your sphere of influence with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so as a service company, I came from an agency background, ad agency. I was a partner in an ad agency for years. And it was the same thing. It's like, well, you know, we were getting our whole marketing plan. We had come out of Hoffman, York, and Compton, and we started uh, our own. And, um, and they're like, well, you're not a real big agency. And like, well, we have a marketing plan. Well, where's your product? Um, the product is what we do for them. Okay, like Carver Boat took 25% away from Sea Ray. Okay, that's the product, okay, of the marketing. But you can't see it. You can't see it. So they had to trust that our marketing plan would be what we would do, okay, because we didn't make a product. Like my husband was with Alan Bradley at the time. They made widgets. They made drives. They made software, right? They made things, okay, and so you could see that, okay. But you and I, MFM is the conduit the conduit that God works through and changes lives. That's the product. You're it. And how you affect the next one. It's changed lives. Because changed lives change lives. Right? That's you. It's absolutely you. So I want to share a couple of changed lives stories very quickly. This was just last week. Someone put it on a prayer request card. It said, I don't, I'm not sure in which of the three studies it was. I almost didn't make it today, first time, but I kept trying to be, because I needed to be in the word, and so I finally got here. What a timely message for me. 
Constant warfare in my home, constant gaslighting from my teen. I know that heaven wins. Thank you, Margo, for bringing and living the word of God. His power was on display in you today and your team. I can't tell you how much I needed that. You don't know how the Holy Spirit's working, right? You don't know. This is from uh, a couple of years ago, and I've always kept it. And so I want to read this to you. Uh, You have been my guide to heavenly wisdom, and I am grateful to God for your teachings and inspiration. I had just finished reading through the Bible for my first time and thought, whew, finish that. That might as well have been in Greek. But then I went to your session, and I have been watching you ever since. You bring the scriptures alive for me and are sculpting my moral compass by inspiring me to steep in his word. I initially read the Bible to come to know Jesus, yet he has given Yet he has given me, in return, so much more. Like women like you, to show me how to live. Thank you for what you do. It ignites my enthusiasm to spread Jesus seeds everywhere. That person, I'm going to weep. That person has so grown up in Christ. She has so grown up. She spreads Jesus everywhere. She asked people the Christmas stuff. 19 women came. I mean, she, she continues to ask and goes about just daily practicing the presence of God because she's a changed life. And now others are changed because of her. And that's the reason we exist, right? To teach women to know Jesus personally and passionately and powerfully and preeminently. And we'll do that until we see him face to face. And now with our online community, I want to share with you how amazing it is. You know, there's one in Seattle. There are 16 women that watch um, together at a home. And the one who heads it up, her name is Dana. And Dana um, said, you've got to read this. This is an amazing text from a beautiful lady who's just joined our MFM Pacific Northwest group. PNW, is that cute or what? I think Becky thought of that. PNW group. And I sent her links to all the Second Corinthians studies. This is a woman writing to Dana. Hi, Dana. Hope all is going well. I've started my Bible study videos and making a weekend of it, feeling excited and exactly what I needed. Thank you. Margo's amazing. And then I leave Monday and will be journaling at the cabin. When I don't finish before I leave, I will at my favorite little coffee shop nearby where I'm staying. Thank you again. This is big for me and at a much-needed time. And then Dana said, here's what she sent me as a follow-up text, and I was weeping through it. She's been through a terrible ordeal. And this is from that lady to Dana. Thank you so very much. My heart is so full. I have to share this. In week one, Margot says to ask ourselves, do I enter into someone else's life with a wisdom that surpasses me and is beyond what I know? And I was moved to tears because I thought about how I shared my personal story with you, Dana, without fear, which never happens. And you being so new in my life, I couldn't understand it, and now I do. And when Margot said this, I actually saw us standing in the arena and how gracious and kind you were, God working through you to me for sure. He was talking to me through you. I see you working with peace and joy in step with the Holy Spirit. Thank you for bringing me hope. Love you to heaven and back, and yes, I am on my knees in thankfulness to God for opening this precious door of these videos and learning about Jesus more and more. I'm also very aware now someone is watching me like a hawk because they want to see me fail, and my guiding light is to to keep bringing hope, like you, Dana, and Margot's mom. Big hugs, and thank you again for welcoming me in. Do you see that? It's not about me. Change life. To this next lady, for a change life, who we don't even know, who's now being changed from glory to glory to glory to glory. That is incomprehensible for any of us to do, except for him. Except for him. And so I, I boldly and unabashedly come to you and ask you to give, and ask you to give, because to give is worship. And as Stuart would always say, Stuart Briscoe, he's like, well, you know, the last thing we tend to give them is our pocketbook, in a very English little accent. And so uh, I, I'm excited to see how God is working in and through this unprecedented time. I mean, it's so amazing just to see him work uh, and, and to keep our eyes 
fixed on him, right? Fixed on him 2020. And so I'm so, so grateful. Okay, I'm excited because we're in 2 Corinthians 4. We're in 2 Corinthians 4. I know there's 13 chapters. Don't worry. We'll walk through it. We got it. God's got this. God's got this. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And the little subhead says what? Treasures in jars of clay. Okay, who's the jars of clay? Raise your hand. Okay, I don't see all hands up. All hands up. Jars of clay. Good, good, good. All right. Okay, so we are the jars of clay. Okay, we're going to get to that. But first of all, I want to share about how... um, the great and glorious covenant, which we've been talking about from the old covenant to the new covenant, okay, and how much more a glorious covenant, the new one, needs to be presented, and that's what Paul is doing. So let's start with prayer, and then I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 of chapter 4. All right, here we go. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for 60 degrees in November in Wisconsin. Lord, thank you for who you are and how you're working and how we trust the unseen. For eternal, eternal purposes, Lord. Uh, We can only take relationships with us, and so God teach us today about how it's more glorious covenant and and how how we carry the new covenant around in us and, and can share with all those around us. So speak to us, speak to us, Holy Spirit, go in and through us and teach us uh, all things, all truths. So we walk out of here changed and uh, glowing more and more like uh, those with unveiled faces. Our faces are unveiled, not veiled like Moses because the glory was fading away, but ours are unveiled with ever-increasing glory so people can see you in us as these Jars of clay as these earthen vessels, as these cracked pots, God, that you can use somehow for your glory. So God, speak because we are listening in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. Okay, let's read uh, 1 through 7 of 2 Corinthians 4. <clears throat> Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Remember, this is Paul speaking to believers. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Right? It's from God and not from us. Okay. So let's dig in, because we're going to see how much more glorious this uh, new covenant is and how it should be presented, okay? Now, Paul is saying, look, I've got this ministry, I've got this ministry, okay, and and it's, it's the gospel. It's the gospel. And I'm going to preach it boldly. I'm going to preach it boldly, okay, because there's inherent power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, inherent power. Okay, so when Paul considered the greatness of his calling, it gave him the confidence, it gave him the heart to face all of his difficulties. And quite frankly, we all tend to lose heart because we don't consider how great the calling is in God because he gives us Jesus. He gives us Jesus. Right, he is the new covenant. Right? And he gives us Jesus. So I want you to understand that Paul's gifts, we're all gifted. 1 Corinthians 14 and 15 tells us that, okay? We're all gifted, okay? Paul's gifts were great, okay? But so was the task that God appointed him to, right? Okay? So his task was magnanimous. It was magnanimous in scope, it was magnanimous in suffering. I want you to open up to 2 Timothy. And read this with me, 8 through 12, because this is the final letter to Timothy, um, Paul's student in Jesus, right, in his cohort. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, and let's read 8 through 12. This is his last 
letter to Timothy, and he's exhorting him, and he's exhorting you and me. So, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. This is Paul speaking. But join with me in suffering for the what? For the gospel, by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us to Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am yet. I am not ashamed because I know who I have believed and am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. How many of you have like memorized that verse, right? I know whom I have believed, right? I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Okay, let's go back then and, uh, to 2 Corinthians 4 and pick up from where we left off. I want you to understand this was Paul's last letter. He's writing to Timothy and he's exhorting him to keep on keeping on with the gospel and he's exhorting you and I as believers, okay? You and me, okay? So God calls us not according to our works, not according to our degree of adequacy. Remember, our adequacy is in Christ alone, okay? So he doesn't call us according to our works. He doesn't call us according to our own degree of adequacy, but according to his purpose, according to his grace. That's how we're called, okay? This is what makes us adequate. We're called to his purpose. We're called to his grace, okay? God appointed Paul. God appoints each one of us because we're the bearer of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus Christ, okay? So you're like, okay, Margo, all right, okay, all right. Well, where do we start then? Where, where do we start, okay? Well, we start where Paul talked about it in 2 Corinthians 4, okay? You resolve, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to lose heart. What do he say? We just read that. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not what? Lose heart. 2 Corinthians 4.1, we do not lose heart. I don't know if you've noticed, but the Christian life isn't just one chain of successes and victories and triumphal parades and one after another. I noticed some teehees going on here, right? It's not, okay? Okay, it, it's warfare against the force of the evil one. Remember when we studied Ephesians 6, right? We're wearing his armor. It's his armor. Thank God it's not ours. It's God's armor that's on us, right? And we walk through this world pushing back what? Darkness. Right? We're light, and light pushes back darkness, and darkness has to obey light, okay? And so it's warfare against the forces of the evil one. And our strength and our courage comes from knowing the truth. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him in John 14, verse 6. And so we know the truth. Now, that's the first thing that we do as we're walking through is that, okay, um, I will resolve that I'm not going to lose heart. Secondly, he says, you renounce, you renounce the things hidden because of shame. Okay? What does he say here? We do not lose heart. Verse 2, rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We've renounced those. Okay? You live open lives. You live transparent lives. What you see is what you get. My walk matches my talk. My talk matches my walk. Okay? You don't hide anything because you know why? You got nothing to hide. Isn't that so good? You guys, I used to live such a deceitful life before I came to know Jesus when I was 31 years old. Such a deceitful life. I wasn't sure if I told this, this, or that. I mean, it, it, was, it was horrific because I lived such a a deceitful life. I tell this person this way because I wanted them to think of me this way, and of course then I would act this way so I'd be with these people, and it was total deceit, okay? Now, I just live an open life. 
I live an open life. Because why? Because I don't hide anything because there's nothing to hide. There's nothing to hide. The past was totally forgiven. There should be hallelujah there. The past was totally forgiven. Okay, isn't that so good? Isn't that so, so great? Okay, we were declared righteous. And now we live accordingly. I was just talking to one of our pastors, Pastor Mac. We were talking about, like, how we came to know Jesus. And I was like, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I was going 180 miles an hour and crashed into, you know, a side of a wall and then er, did a 180-degree turn and followed Jesus, right? And, and I said, and so I so know that, you know, that's not who I am anymore, and this is who I am in Christ Jesus. I'm so forgiven. Past, present, and future sin. And then he was able to share, like Stuart Briscoe, how he just accepted that Jesus was the way, truth, and the life um, from a little kid on. And just like Stuart, I said, well, you know what you did? I said, you were like Stuart, where you were a, you were like a flower. You're like a rose. And then you just kept, that bud just kept, growing and growing and growing, and kept unfolding your life, open to him, and being obedient, and living a transformed life, and knowing that you have Jesus Christ living in and through you, and you want to please him with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so, and so he doesn't have a ton of things, you know, like I do, that were like shame, huge shame. Oh, there's a ton of sin, right? Obviously, sin is sin, right? There's no, like, descending order of sin, Okay, but, but it was really, it was great to talk about that because, you know, he lives an open life, and, and this is how he's come to Christ, and I live an open life because I came to Christ like a big, you know, like a board over my head. Hey, I love you. I love you. Turn around. Turn around, right? Trust me, okay? And so both of our pasts, though, are totally forgiven. How great is that, okay? And we were declared righteous, just like you are declared righteous, okay? And now we live accordingly. How do we do that? How do we live accordingly? Well, both Mac and I said the same thing. Keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit, right? You're living in step with the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit in you, right, that was given, new covenant of his blood that was given to us that we keep in step with, okay? It's the power of the Holy Spirit in me, in you, through the new covenant of Jesus' shed blood. How great is that, right? And so we're able to renounce those hidden because of shame, okay? And thirdly, he says we don't need to walk in craftiness. He says, verse 2, Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception. That's craftiness. We do not use deception. That's craftiness. We don't have to. Because why? There's nothing to cover up. Do you know how freeing that is? Right? Totally free. There's nothing to cover up. Okay, we, we're able to, or, or there's nothing to compensate for. Because why? Because we don't have to be anyone else for anyone else. Right? You don't have to change because I'm around these people. I'm going to change. I'm around these people. I'm this. You don't have to. Right? We don't have to be anyone else for anyone else because we only have to be us who God made us to be. So there's no, ne there's no necessity for any kind of deception or any kind of craftiness as we're walking in the new covenant. And then fourthly, Paul says in this verse, that then you don't twist or distort the word of God. What does he say? In verse 2, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. Nor do we distort the word of God. We tend to distort the word of God for our own perverted pleasures. For our own perverted pleasures. Uh, for our own perverted affirmations. Or gain, or gain somehow. Paul's like, no, 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 you don't distort the word of God. You hold nothing back. That's how Paul walked. He held nothing back. You got to remember, he was, oh, he was usually in jail. Why? Because he held nothing back. Because he shared the word of God, and he just let God be God, right? And it's like, I don't like that. That's not right. He's like, this is what it is. This is who he is. It's the same thing with us. You just walk, and you hold nothing back. You hold nothing back. 
For you to hold nothing back, though, you got to know the Word of God. you got to be in the Word of God. It's great to be under the Word of God like today and on Sundays and this, but you got to be in the Word of God, non-negotiable, face-to-face time with Him, right? To be in His Word, in His Word. And so, and so that you're in the Word for yourself, you're in the Word for others, you're in uh, for counsel of others, you're in for instruction, you're in for teaching. That doesn't mean that you're going to get up here and teach. It doesn't necessarily mean that. But you are being used as an earthen vessel with others because you have the light in you. You have the light in you. That's who you are, right? And so we don't twist or distort the Word of God to say what we wish it would say, to meet our fleshly perverted ways. No. We read the word of God and we respond to the word of God, right? Through conviction. It's the living word of God, living active. As you read it, it reads you. It's a living active word of God and we respond to the word of God. We don't like go, oh, word of God, you got to respond to me. I don't like this part. You ever do that? I used to do that years ago. Oh, I'm not, not this, I probably, he probably didn't mean that. <laughs> really? Really? Of course he did. He wants me to respond. He wants me to respond to him and become more and more like him and less and less like my putrid self, right? Because it's the manifestation of truth in and through you as this, you know, earthen vessel. It's this manifestation of truth that he says that commends you to every person's conscience in the sight of God. That's what we just read. Let's read it again. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. In the sight of God. Okay? So just like Paul, you and I, are to share God's word, the gospel, your story, how he's changing you, what the word of God is telling you, right? Okay, and, and how did Paul, we just walked through it, how does, how does he share that? He shares it boldly, unabashedly. Just like, well, you know, I mean, you know, I was okay before, but are you kidding me? Nobody was okay before. We all deserved what? Death. We all deserve death, absolutely, okay? And so, and so he shared it boldly. He also shared it humbly. Boldly the word went out, but humbly. Humbly, he shared it humbly. He also shared it honestly. We just read that, right? He didn't water it down. He didn't you know, use it like for his own pleasure kind of stuff. Okay, I noticed numerous times now, be very careful who you listen with podcasts and, and on TV and and online and everything, because, because there are quite a few teachers and pastors and everything that tend to water down the gospel. They tend to water it down. They only talk a little bit about this, because this is their passion. But they won't tell the whole truth, okay? And so be very careful with that, because what happens is, is they're watering it down to accommodate their audience, because it's entertaining. It's entertaining. Okay, like I said before, nobody needs another speaker to entertain. We need to have the Holy Spirit change us. From glory to glory to glory to glory, right? Until we see him face to face, okay? Now, he does it boldly, he does it um, humbly, he does it honestly, and he does it with integrity. He walks his walk. He talks his talk with integrity, okay? And he does it all in the sight of God. That's most important. That's who he reports to. That's who we report to. It's in the sight of God. Right? I want to please him with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? And I'm doing it in the sight of him. So he goes on and, and shares, which we're going to dig into in a minute. But he says, well, okay, well, what if everybody that you share you know, your story with and gospel with and you talk with and everything, what if they don't believe? What, what, if, they don't, what if they don't believe? Okay, what, what if, you know, is it like my fault? Is it my fault? I mean, is it a result of, like, my inadequacy? Because, like, I didn't know enough or something? No, he tells us the gospel is veiled. The gospel is veiled. Let's read again from 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verses 3 and 4. 
And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Okay, so remember, it's not your fault, okay? Just share. Just share. He takes it. He takes it and uses it, okay? There's no inadequacy because he's your adequacy and he lives in you, okay? So the unbelieving, the unbelieving have a veil over their minds, over their minds, okay? So, uh, and that's why they're not responding to such a glorious gospel, just like me. I had a veil over my mind, and I wasn't responding to a glorious gospel, okay? Now, if people don't respond to this glorious gospel, I want to share again, that wasn't Paul's fault. And it wasn't the gospel's fault because there's inherent power in the gospel because of Jesus Christ's blood, okay? Okay, only those who are perishing, who are perishing, miss the message. Only those who are lost. Only those who are not yet saved, okay? Okay, here's what Spurgeon says. The blindness of unbelievers in no way detracts from the clearness of the gospel, for the sun is no less resplendent because the blind do not perceive its light. Did you hear that? Let me read it again. The blindness of unbelievers, the veil that's over them, right, of unbelievers in no way detracts from the clearness of the gospel. For the sun, meaning the sunshine, the sun is no less resplendent because the blind do not perceive its light. Those who are perishing, those are whom the gospel is veiled, they have been blinded by Satan, called the God of this age. The God of this age, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that they or you, before you came to know Jesus, were innocent victims of Satan's blinding work, okay? It doesn't mean you're an innocent victim, okay? Satan's work upon them is not the only reason that they're blinded, okay? John 3, 19, John 3, 19 says, this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, okay? Now, though people love darkness, okay, and choose darkness, Satan still works hard to keep them blinded, to keep the veil, okay, over their eyes from the glorious light and salvation in Christ Jesus. Now, let me ask you something. Think back in how you were blinded before you believed. Just think back in how you personally were blinded before you believed. Okay? Satan went after your mind. He went after your mind. You know, it's all like beguilement, like it was in the Garden of Eden when he came to Eve and said, did God really say? Did God really say? It's that beguilement where he tells you a little bit of truth. Well, yeah, God did say. And she should have said what he said. But it's a little tiny, you know, it's a little truth, but a lot of emotion. He adds a lot to it, okay? And so you notice that it's the minds of the unbelieving that are blinded, okay? Yes, he works on the emotions as well of the lost, okay? But the main battleground for Satan is your mind, is your mind. That's the main battleground, okay? That's also why God has chosen his word, God's word right here, living active word, okay, to transmit the gospel, to transmit the gospel because the the word, living, active word of God touches our minds. We're supposed to fill our mind with the word of God, okay? Fill our mind, okay? And it can touch the minds that the God of this age has blinded, okay? We are continually to, supposed to fill up with the word of God. You're not ever supposed to, don't ever, ever, ever listen to someone who says, oh, you're supposed to empty your mind. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, oh, no. You continue to fill your mind up. Fill your mind up with truth because the truth is what sets you free. And you fill your mind up with the word of God, living, active, sharper than what? 
Two-edged sword, right? Okay, now let's talk about the God of this age for a minute. The God of this age, okay, the title God of this age uh, is not used of Satan anywhere else in Scripture but the thought right here in this passage. However, he's called other things which mean this God of this age. Like in John 12, 31, this is when Jesus was predicting his death and telling the disciples. And Jesus said, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. God of this age, prince of this world. John 14, 30. He's telling the disciples the promise of the Holy Spirit. When he leaves, the Holy Spirit will come, okay? And he says, Jesus says, I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming, and he has no hold over me. Prince of this world, God of this age, okay? Ephesians 2, verse 2. You were dead in your sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of this air. A-I-R. God of this age. And then last one I want to give you is 1 John 5, 19, which says, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under control of the evil one. Now, there is a significant and real sense in which Satan rules this world. Rules is in quotation marks, okay? Now, not in the ultimate sense, because we know God, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh God, personal name of God, in Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness the world, and those who dwell therein. Yet, if you remember, Jesus didn't contest Satan's claim to rule over this present age when he was tempted. Remember when he was tempted? Satan came to him, he was going to go to his teaching ministry, and Satan came, came to him and tempted him. And one of the things that he said is he, he said, look, I'm, I'm going to take you up to this high place, Jesus, and I'm going to show you all the kingdoms of the world, and I'm going to give you all the authority, splendor that's been given me if you would be willing to what? Bow down to me. And Jesus turns around and says, it is written, he uses rhema, right, direct Scripture from Logos, the Word of God, and he says, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But the reason I brought that up is, is that Jesus didn't contest Satan's claim to rule over this present age because there is a sense in which Satan is the popularly elected. Sort of funny that's today, isn't it? <laughs> that just came to me. <laughs> Popularly elected, I'm glad I got armor on, popularly elected ruler of this age. Are you following me? Okay. Now, no, no. Oh, no. Not over till Jesus says it's over, Michelle. Not over till Jesus says it's over, baby. Okay? All right. So God alone is the king of all ages. You know that, right? He's the king of all ages, okay? That is of every age, past, present, future, okay? And so it's the devil who here is called the god of this world, okay, or the god of this age because he rules over the greatest part of the world and then they are the servants and slaves to him, okay? Now, let me just explain it one more way. The devil is called the god of this age in no other way than Baal. Remember Baal, B-A-A-L? He was an idol that they worshipped, a false god. Okay, Then Baal was called the god of those who worshipped him. Now, Satan can only blind those who do not believe. He could only blind those who do not believe. Okay, Now, and here's the deal. 
We all have free will. We all have a choice. And God's always initiating a relationship with you. Always. First Peter 3, 9. I don't want anybody to perish. I want everybody to come to know me. And so what does he do? He goes after you. He goes after you. He's like, how into heaven? How into heaven? How into heaven? And he's always giving you an opportunity to come to him, to come to him, to come to him, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in me, whoever, everybody say whoever. whoever. Right. Isn't that so good? It's so, so good, okay? And so, and so what happens is, you can only blind those who don't believe, okay? But if you're tired, okay, of having your mind blinded by the God of this age, then just simply put your trust in who Jesus is and what he did for you. And guess what? Satan can't blind you anymore. The veil falls off. Like what happened when I was 31 years old. All of a sudden, I could see, Right? First I was blind, then I could see. You have a choice. You have a free will, okay? The God of this world is only able to blind the minds of the unbelieving. Refusal to believe is the secret and reason of the blindness that happens to people. We're all given a choice, and we're given it all the time. He says there's enough in all of creation to know him. In all of creation, shouts his name. He says, he says, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ should shine on them. So to see this glory of Christ is to be saved. You don't have a veil on it anymore. It's to be saved, okay? And so, and so therefore, Satan directs his energies into what? Into blinding people. Into blinding people from them ever seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. That's what he does. And so understanding Satan's strategy with unbelievers should affect how we pray for them. How we pray for them, right? We should ask God, God, shine your light. Shine your light. Go after them. Bind the blinding work of Satan. Light has to push back darkness. Blind, blind, blind that, God, from them. It's that blinding work and take that, God, and, and give that person faith to what? To overcome the unbelief that invites that blinding. Right? Satan's strategy with unbelievers should affect the way that we pray for them. That's how my mom prayed for me. It's like, oh, God, you go after whatever it takes. I don't care whatever it takes. You go after whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, Lord. Shine your light. Whatever it takes into her darkness, just shine your light. I trust you. Then at the, after I came to Christ, she's like, Mary, I had no idea you had to go that low. <laughs> right? It's that eternal thumb pressure. Hey, Margo, I love you. Hey, Margo, I love you. Hey, Margo, I love you. Right? And he's like, and, 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 then, and then to ask him to absolutely bind the blinding work of Satan. God. Just bind that blinding work. They don't even see that there's a veil over their face. God, just bind that, God. And then what? And give them faith to overcome that unbelief that invites the blinding. Because they're walking in that darkness. Remember, you are the servant that's praying. He's the Savior. You're not the Savior. That's a good, good thing. That's a good, good thing. It's not you, right? It's him. And he wants them already to come to him. He's already gone after him. You're just joining him in what he's doing. How great is that, right? We're the, ones, we're the ones praying. He's the one saving. He's the one saving. Only God can rescue us permanently. You know that, right? Permanently. I'm rescued permanently. What about you? Is that great? doesn't matter what happens. I'm rescued permanently. That way, Linda, she's in the back cranking. All right? Now, Paul knew, Paul knew that he was talking about, um, he knew exactly what he was talking about when he wrote this. Because why? Because Paul was completely blind to the truth until God broke through the darkness. What was Paul's name to begin with? Saul. What was he doing? Killing Christians. That's right. Killing Christians. Killing Christians. Okay? And so Paul first encountered Jesus. Jesus, the Lord, struck him with literal what? Literal blindness on the road to what? Damascus, right? So he was struck both spiritually and physically, okay? And so spiritually and physically then his eyes were open to the glory of Jesus Christ. 
right? And then he said, your name is Paul, and I have chosen you to be my dude. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Don't you love that? Don't you love that? If you have a past like that, thank you, Lord, because look at the future. doesn't matter how you started. matters how you finish. matters how you finish over and over again. I love how God so worked. If you want to read that story, not right now, but when you get home, it's in Acts 9 and 1 through 19 about how Saul was, you know, going out and he was going to be doing this, this, and killing Christians and this, this, taking him back to Jerusalem, kill him and this, this, and, and he was zealous about it, zealous about it. And God's like, uh, I got another uh, thought here. Uh, yeah. And so how would he stop him? Right, he had to stop him by blinding him. How great is that? He'll do anything. He'll do anything to go after. To go after your friends, to go after your husband, to go after your family. Anything. That's why my mom said, I trust you totally, whatever it is. People would say, oh, but what, I mean, what if something really bad happened to her? Nothing, nothing, nothing could be worse than Margot missing out on eternity with Jesus Christ. Nothing could be worse. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. So Paul knew what he was talking about when he wrote this, that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ will shine on them. Okay, Now, that word light in the Greek uh, here is the same word as in Psalm 44, 3. It says, for the light of your face. For the light of your countenance, okay? Or in Psalm 78, 14, where it says, In the daytime also he led them in the cloud, excuse me, with the cloud, and all the night with a light of fire, okay? So the word light then signifies brightness emitted by a radiant body, right? Once again, Shekinah glory, right? By his radiant body, his radiant body, okay? Now, For those who you have been praying for, let's just take a moment and pray quietly. Uh, for those who don't know Jesus, and I always say yet, who don't know Jesus yet, okay? And I'm asking you just to put their name in, that you would ask God to shine his light, that he would shine his light and push back darkness in this person, that he would bind the blinding work of Satan, in this person's life because Satan loves to work in the mind and that he would give faith to overcome the unbelief that invites that blinding. So let's just take a moment quietly and pray this for a specific person or maybe two or three that you know that you um, want them to come to know Jesus. Lord, thank you that everyone can come to this realization. It's for everyone. But it's through you and your grand glory. So we give you these people. You love them more than we do. We give them to you. We set them at your feet. Actually, we, 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 just, we just take them over, Lord Jesus, to the bottom of the cross and have the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse them from all sin, God. And to you say, today is your day of salvation. And so we ask you to move and push that darkness back, God, and reveal yourself because you're the self-revealing God even today to them. Let them be free of those shackles that bind them, that Satan has so deceived them with a veil over their eyes. And so we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So, how do each of us come to that realization, okay? How did I come to this great and glorious day in my life, okay, when this immoral woman told God that, you know what, I am done sowing to my flesh. I am done sowing to my flesh, and I want to live for you the rest of my days. 
I mean, how, how do you come to that realization? Well, I came to that moment only because of the incomprehensible grace of God, just like you did. The incomprehensible grace of God, who by himself was shining in my heart, was shining in my heart to give me the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, right? He was doing what? To give me the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Now, I didn't understand theology at that point. Right? I didn't understand theology uh, in what I did, but I knew that I just needed to bow my knee to him and give my life to him. Okay, I, I, No longer did I want to run my own life. No longer did I want to dishonor him. I didn't want to dishonor him anymore. I told him, look, you take control. You absolutely take control. And the light shone out of darkness of my slavery to sin, and then I became a new creation in Jesus Christ. It happens by revelation. Everyone comes to know Jesus Christ by revelation. He reveals himself, he reveals himself, he reveals himself, he reveals himself, that, that he shines himself to you and that veil is taken away and you believe and you believe and you're a new creation in Christ. The old is gone and the new has come. Right? I became a creation, new creation in Jesus Christ. Even as God spoke and he brought light to his creation on the day he created the heavens and the day he created the earth. Right? That's what he does. That's who he is. He brings light into it. He brings light into it. So now let's look at um, how we are treasures in these clay pots. Okay? So let's look at verses 5 and 6. Uh, with the topic of Paul's preaching is Jesus and not himself, okay? And that should be all of us. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Okay? Now, here we are. We are these treasures in clay pots, in clay pots. Now, Paul wasn't standing at the pulpit and telling everybody in his ministry before an audience, okay? He wasn't preaching about himself. It wasn't about Paul, okay? He was not important. He was not the focus. He wanted the Holy Spirit to speak in and through him. So, so, so he could strongly say, he could strongly say, we do not preach ourselves, we don't preach ourselves. The focus is on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the only one to preach about. In fact, he kept saying um, that he just wanted to lift up his cross. Lift, I will boast about nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, not everyone who opens up a Bible and starts talking and preaching about Jesus Christ, okay, um, actually is preaching Jesus Christ. A lot of them are preaching about themselves. If the focus is on funny stories, if the focus is on entertaining the crowd, uh, if the focus is on even touching life experiences uh, of that preacher, he may be preaching or she may be preaching about himself or herself. Now, Often people love, love when the preacher is preaching about himself or herself, okay? Now, it seems revealing, it seems intimate, and it is, and it's transparent, okay? And it's often entertaining, but what happens is it becomes tempting to just go from cute story to cute story to cute story to cute story, and then you're forgetting that the Word of God is what changes people. The Word of God, living and active, is what changes. That's why we will always be in the book, the book, the Word of God, okay? So... Only Jesus, okay, the preacher can't change people. Only Jesus, the Holy Spirit, can change people, okay, can save your eternal soul. So it behooves the preacher and teacher to only preach Jesus, okay? Now, is it wrong for, like, me or for a preacher to share a joke or to share, like, uh, what God's doing in and through their life or a story? from their life? No, no, it's not. It's a matter of proportion. 
It's a matter of proportion, okay? It's like asking this, is it all right to put salt in the soup? Okay, is it all right to put salt in the soup? Is it? Yes, but it's about what? Proportion, right? It's about proportion, okay? You don't want to put in too much. And if week after week after week, too much of the preachers in this sermon, guess what? It all becomes all about him and not about Jesus. And not about Jesus, okay? Don't we have a greater message to share than just about ourselves? Absolutely we do. We're the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? And it wasn't only that Paul did not preach about himself. He did not preach a gospel of moral reform. It's very important. He didn't preach a gospel of a list of rules that you follow. Here's the do's, here's the don'ts, here's the this, here's the that, and if you follow these, there's the gospel. Not true. Not true. There's inherent power in the gospel. It's not about do's and don'ts. What happens is, is when you have the Holy Spirit living in you, and then he goes, mm, 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 and then you don't want to do that. Then you stare away from that. It's not that you have a checklist, I can't, 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 do, do, right? When I grew up, my dad used to say, um, can't dance, drink, or chew, or go with the boys that do. So what do you think I did? I didn't ever chew. So, <laughs> right? Right? I mean, it was like, okay, all right. Yeah, all right. Okay, it's, you guys, that's not the gospel. Okay, that's not the gospel. Okay? It's not a gospel of moral reform. It's not a gospel of list of rules that you have to follow to be right with God. It's Jesus. You preach Jesus. Okay? You present Jesus Christ the Lord, okay? So Paul's goal in preaching was to bring people to Jesus, not to himself. Just like I said in the beginning, MFM exists because what? You want people to come to know Jesus, come to know Jesus, not to know me, to know Jesus. It's all about him. This is what Spurgeon says. To make the end of preaching the teaching of virtue To render men honest, sober, benevolent, and faithful is part and parcel of that wisdom of the world that is foolishness with God. It is attempting to raise fruit without trees. When a man is brought to recognize Jesus Christ as Lord and to love and worship him as such, then he becomes like Christ. What more can the moralist want? The gospel isn't a set of rules. It isn't, you know, a a moral code. It's Jesus. And you become a new creation. And then you desire, you follow him and follow him, and you desire to do the next right thing, the next right thing, to please him. See, when, when Paul did present himself, this is how he did it. He says, look, we're we're servants, we're a bondservant. Bond servant means that you're serving the lowest of the slaves. You're lowest and you're serving the bond, you're serving the servant. He says, I'm a bond servant. I'm a bond servant for Jesus' sake. Notice he didn't say, I'm a bond servant for my sake, I'm a bond servant for your sake. No, he was a bond servant for Jesus' sake, right? If it was for his own sake, or if it was for the Corinthian Christians at the time, right? It wouldn't last. It wouldn't last. It would be real fleshy. It would be fleshy, okay? Paul served others for Jesus' sake. I'm serving you for Jesus' sake. He did it primarily to please Jesus, not to please man. My mom used to say, hey, Margo, just be a Colossians 3 chick. Be a Colossians 3 chick. Be a Colossians 3 chick. And what she meant is Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to the Father through him. Right? It's funny because when I was, you know, had this purpose yesterday and I was doing this, 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 and everything, then Brian uh, was off because he took off work because it was a glorious day, and so he had a purpose for me too. Is that funny how that happens? And I'm like, oh, well, you know what, hon? Maybe we should have talked about that and everything. So he was, and he does it wonderfully, uh, he, was ta- he was washing all the windows, and it was, he does a glorious job on it. And he, I mean, it's like he's a professional window washer. I'm like, honey, this is great. Oh, but honey, can you come along behind me? And like, could you just like go along the corner and all the doors and all that? 
And God brought Colossians 3.17 to me. He's like, Margo, you're working for me. You're working for me. You're working for me. You're not working for him. Don't get an attitude. Don't get anything. I know you've got this and everything, but you know what? Interruptions of the day are from me. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And then I had to walk through it, right? And it was great. We had everything done, and it was good, right? You're, you're, you're working for the Lord, not for men. Right? You're working for the Lord, not for men, okay? And Paul is saying, look, it, the Lord who, who absolutely created and commanded light to shine out of darkness, okay? The Lord created in this physical world when he said, let the light shine, right? That's in Genesis 1-3. Okay, he said, let there be light, and there was light. Paul really, really believed the account of the creation described in Genesis 1, that God created light with a command. He spoke it, and it became true. And Paul believed that's exactly how it happened. And now he's saying, the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts, that same God, that same God, that big God, right? And he's talking about his own conversion. Think about that. His own conversion, actually, right in Acts 9, 1 through 9, right? On his way to Damascus, persecute, kill, right? And suddenly a light shone from heaven and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he's like, who is that, Lord? Because he didn't know. He had a veil. Didn't know yet. He didn't know yet. See, a good way of describing every believer is that you and I are people with shining hearts that then have unveiled faces with ever-increasing glory, and then our faces get more and more shiny. Right? How great is that? We have shining hearts, and then what happens? It says God's shown in our hearts, and it should start as our lives are shining in Jesus Christ. And so we should be these really shiny individuals as we go through life, right? It makes our faces shine. And why? It says to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. So what has exactly God shown in our hearts? To give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, okay? And so what is that? Well, God gives us the light of the knowledge of God, and we have the responsibility to get it out. It's the gospel. It's the good news, right? He shined it in so we could shine it out. You just don't keep it. It's funny. God brought a really funny example to me this morning. I was up early, and the sun was just coming, blaring, and it was glorious, wasn't it? I mean, it was just coming in, and, and I was sitting, and I was sitting in a, a chair, and the sun was just beating on me, and it felt so excellent. And I thought, I thought, here I am. I'm enjoying the sunshine so much. And it's like, okay, so he shines in me so I can shine out. And then I thought, okay, what if I wanted to keep all that sunshine to myself, right, that's coming in. What if I just wanted to keep all that sunshine to myself, okay? And then so that I would say, okay, you know what, okay, all the sunshine's coming in, coming out of me. So now I'll want to keep it all myself, so I'll just shut the curtains. I'll just shut the curtains, right, uh, so that none of the light gets out. Are you following me? Okay, now this is going through my head, okay? So none of the light gets out, okay? And, and so what have I done? I've just put myself back into what? darkness. I've just put myself back into darkness, okay? So when you try to hoard up your light in yourself, Margo, he was sharing with me, okay, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. I shine in you, so you shine out to people. You don't save up sunshine and close the way, because then all of a sudden you're in darkness. Was that so good? And I just, I sat there and laughed, and my dog, my, my dog, Kali Cedar, is next to me, and she's looking at me like, you know, like, oh, that's funny, Mom. You know how they get excited? Like, she comes over like, like, what are you laughing at? I mean, it's sort of early, and I'm like, you wouldn't get it, Cedar. <laughs> you, you wouldn't get it, right? So we come to the knowledge of the glory of God by seeing it in the face of Jesus, by seeing it in the face of Jesus. God gave us a display, a perfect representation of his glory, his son, Jesus Christ, right? The God-man, the God-man. And Jesus says in John 14, 9, he who has seen me has seen the 
has seen the Father, okay? And he also prayed that we would see his glory, the glory of God the Father, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, John 17, 24. So we have this amazing, great treasure in, in closing because we're going to really dig into this next week and then see how um, this, this cracked pot um, walks, through, walks through suffering, walks through um, when you pursue the course of holiness in your life, we're going to see what you can expect. You're going to see what you can expect because we have this incredible, great, great treasure in a humble container. And that's us. And that's us. Okay? And the treasure is the greatness, is the greatness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the glory of God made evident then through that gospel. That's, that's who he is. Okay? So it's the very light, light shines into us, and we shine out, and the light of the knowledge of the glory of God reflected in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the greatest treasure in all of creation, and it's in us. Okay. Okay. I'm going to hold right here. And it's in us. Okay. All right. Much better. It was good work out there. Okay. All right. Excellent. All right. Because God considers us his earthen vessels. Okay, we're his earthen vessels. Isn't that so great? We are his earthen vessels, okay? And, in, and, 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 and the value that God puts on us as the everyday earthen vessel. So who's worthy to be a container for God's glory, okay, and, and, and for his light, okay? Well, the smartest person isn't smart enough. The most intelligent person isn't intelligent enough. The most spiritual person isn't spiritual enough, right? What it is... The most talented person isn't talented enough. We're all clay pots. We're all clay pots holding an unspeakable great treasure. An amazing, amazing treasure. I want to just end with this. You guys realize that earthenware vessels back then were very common in the ancient world in every home, right? They were very, very common, okay? They were very durable uh, compared um, to metal, but they were useless if they were broken. Like if it was glass, you could at least melt the glass back together and you could use it, okay? But they were cheap and they were a little intrinsic value. But God chose to put the light and glory in the everyday dishes, like you and me, and not the fine china. Isn't that so great? As I was studying this this last week, I was getting out my, you know, you have everyday dishes, right? Everyday dishes, right? But you use those everyday dishes, all the time. You know, the special china and the special crystalness, that's for like special occasions. But oh no, the everyday dishes, it's all the time. Think how much more useful you are as an everyday dish. And not just a special use like at Christmas or Thanksgiving, right? How great is that? So we are these everyday dishes that are supposed to shine. That are supposed to shine. My mom had Corel. Do you guys remember that? Is that still around? Okay. All right. Corel. Oh, my word. You could pretty much drop those things anywhere and they like bounce. I don't know what they're made out of. Okay. But I mean, that was her everyday dish, right? And, and I look back at that and I think, you know what, God? Thank you. Thank you that you can use me continually as a piece of Corel, right? For, for everybody, okay? Because he takes the plain, ordinary, everyday and he uses us for our good, for his glory, and for others' benefit. Isn't that so great? So go and be a piece of Corel this week, right? <laughs> Excellent. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word that speaks volumes, that speaks into our heart, that speaks specifically, that you are, that you are transcendent, but you're imminent, God. Thank you for speaking to us this morning. Thank you that we can conform to the likeness of your son. God, that's transformation, transformation. Continue to tra transform us from glory to glory to glory. And God, continue to have us pray for those that don't know you yet, that the blinders would fall off, that they would respond to you because you are the one who initiates. You're the hound of heaven. You don't want anybody to perish but all to come to know you. And so let the blinders fall off, God. Continue to go after them. 
Only you can do that. And we love joining you in unleashing you in their lives. And God, I give you the United States of America. I just give it to you. And I'm asking for your mercy. Just mercy. Something that we don't (laughs) deserve. But you give. And so I thank you for that. I love that you're king and that you reign. And that we can shine no matter what. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. All right, so read to the end of uh, four because we're going to dig into uh, us as cracked pots.